Thank you. Uh, we are here today with Gina Yashire, um, and I'm Sophia Jackson, <laughs> editor and founder of Aphrodisiac Theatre News. And um, Gina's just putting some eye drops in. <laughs> oh yeah, mate. <laughs> well, as a dry as hell. They need a pinch, but we're good to go. <laughs> thank you. Um, so firstly, thank you for keeping me entertained by your Insta Instagram account, uh, particularly during lockdown. Um, I, lo I love how you call out fuckeries when you see it, and more importantly, your tunes on Tuesday um, always takes me down <laughs> lane, and I do often Shazam, I bloody hate it. <laughs> but sometimes I gotta Shazam. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to know what, <laughs> what, what did you do during lockdown that kept you, who kept you entertained, and um, how did you keep yourself entertained? during the madness of the last 16 months? Oh, well, I I was very productive during lockdown. So during lockdown, obviously, me and my missus were doing silly videos called Corona Diaries because we were like, we don't know how long this is going to go. Let's do a thing called Corona Diaries. We can look back and see what we were doing because this is going you know, to go down in history. So we started doing these Corona Diaries and we were doing these little sketches every day and they just got more and more elaborate and it became like work because I'd have to sit down and go, okay, so let me write an idea. So it became like I was making a damn TV show every day. And after like a month of it, I was like, I'm tired. Let's just do it every other day or once a week. And people were like, wait, where's our daily Corona Diaries? And I'm like, you lot don't know how much fucking work this is. Yeah. <laughs> that I ain't getting paid for. And I've got other <laughs> shit I'm supposed to do, be doing. Um, so, but because I didn't realize it was going to be that long. Yeah, yeah no we, one did. You know, yeah. I don't know how many Corona diaries we did, but we did a lot. We did a um, lot, but and we didn't know how long it was going to go on. But, um, but I was doing that. I was reading a lot, and I was writing my book. So I got the book deal a good year before, and uh, I wasn't sure whether I was going to have time to write the book myself because I had the TV show I was writing producing and acting on the TV show. I was still doing all my voiceover stuff on the side, still doing stand up. So I was constantly working, I didn't know. And I met up with a, a ghostwriter to write the book, but what she came back with was just not up to pass. So I was like, this ain't gonna work. So I fired her. Oh, and wow. Basically I was like, I'm, I'm gonna have to write this book myself, which I don't know if I've got the time or the capacity for. I've never written a book, but, COVID happened, we're on shut lockdown, and I was like, well, I ain't going nowhere for the next God knows how long. Yeah. Let me buckle down and write the book. So that's what I did during lockdown. I wrote a memoir. <laughs> um, how long did it, how much of the lockdown did that take then? Most of it. I mean, I didn't write every day. I'm not, I'm not that disciplined. I'll write chunks. Yeah. Then I'll put it down. And then two weeks later, I'll go, oh, fuck, I've got a deadline. I need to write some more. And then I'd write, 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 write. You know, I'd write at any time. I'd start writing at six in the evening and be sitting there till three, four in the morning. Oh, wow. Or I'd just get up in the middle of the night and go, I've got to write. I'd get up at three in the morning and write. Or, you know, so I didn't have a specific schedule. I just wrote when the feeling took me. And then I'd write and then I'd go back and I'd edit it and re-edit. And then, yeah, and that's how I did it. And then obviously I sent it to the publisher. They went through it, they came back with a bunch of notes and then I had to go through the entire book again and, and add stuff, take stuff away, whatever. So, and that was the process. But considering it was my very first book. Yeah. I did pretty good. Um, well, yeah, you, you've good. been super productive. So now that lockdown has been lifted, I, I have missed your hotel reviews. Mm -hmm. So are you, Planning on traveling to the UK? I saw you cut out there. I don't know whether that, that's your internet or mine. Oh. Probably yours. My... <laughs> what did you say? Oh, sorry. I just said that now that lockdown's been lifted, are you looking forward to traveling again? Because I've missed your hotel reviews. Wow. Uh, yeah, that hotel reviews, that was another thing. Gina's hotel rooms, I loved yeah. seeing those because I was on the road constantly. I'm very, very germophobic and OCD. So yeah. that became a thing that I used to just do for myself. And then I just started posting it and it became a thing and people loved it. But I can't do as many now because I have a TV show now. So I'm here. I'm not on the road as much 
at all really i've hardly been on the road in fact yeah i've not been on the road really much for the last two years i've done a couple of little bits and pieces here and there and i've made sure to do a hotel route and review or where i had to get away for a weekend and i went to palm springs for the weekend i did a review of the house yeah i've even got i did an rv i did like a camping trip where i wasn't camping because i don't sleep on the ground but no you've got one of those buses those like and with the kitchen and the bedroom and all that. And uh, over here it's called an RV. I can't remember what it's called in English. Kind of like a caravan, but much bigger and much posher. Yeah. Um, so I got, I got a poster review of that place. I, I did the trip like a month ago and I've just been so busy, I haven't had a chance to edit together the review. But yeah, so not. I don't think you're gonna get as many hotel reviews going forward. Not while I'm making my TV show. Once the TV show, we finish this season, which will be around about March next year, I may go back on the road and then you may see some more reviews or I may not. I might be just, you know what? I'm tired. I don't want to leave my house. Well, I was months, going to. So I ain't getting nowhere. So, yeah. So, yeah. I'm so going to come back to England though, for sure. That, that's when I come exactly. back to the UK, I stay with my friends. So that's, that's I stay with friends was, and family. So, yeah. That's what I was going to ask. You, when are you coming back to the UK? Listen, I wanted to come back a couple months ago and do a quick show. Yeah. But COVID restrictions, man. Boris and fucking Biden need to get their shit together. Yeah. And work out what the, because if you follow my Instagram, you know I had a party at the house this weekend and my best friend and my brother was supposed to be coming over for that party. Oh. I, I, you know, I, their flights were booked. There was, because I always celebrate with them because. They're the reason I've got this TV show because I almost said no to it. Right. I almost said no to it because I, I didn't trust, you know, when two, a white uh, sitcom producer comes to you and goes, well, I want you, well, I'm making a show with Africans and I want you to be a consultant on that show. I, I didn't trust it. I was like, this sounds exploitative and performative and weird. I have no interest in this. And it was my brother and best friend who were like, are you a fucking idiot? This is the biggest sitcom maker in the world. Right. You're always complaining that there's no opportunities for you to rise. Here's an opportunity that's falling in your lap and you're about to turn it down, you idiot. And luckily I listened to good advice and I was good. like, let me move forward. And look at that. This show has just changed my life completely. So whenever I'm having stuff in America, parties or anything, I fly my brother and fly my best friend over that's really to nice. celebrate with me. Do you know what I mean? And so, uh, I think so that's it's disappointing. Really... Yeah, well, they, I owe them everything. I owe them everything. So I did they, have they a question. To fly. I, I yeah. did. So I don't know when I'm coming back to England. If the question the answer to your question, I'm hoping to come back at Christmas, okay. see my friends and family, yeah. maybe do a show or two, because I miss my British fans. I miss my Brits, and I've got so many new stories to tell but yeah um, i'm hoping to get back around christmas going back to bob hart's abishola um mm -hmm. we can't get that here can we not yet but you will i mean listen people are hitting me up on instagram when are we get it's not my decision you got to hit up warner brothers warner brothers own the Hi. show you need to tweet and instagram warner brothers and go Where's my show? We want the show in England. Why aren't we getting it? Yeah. It's not my decision. You guys would have had the show from season one if it was up to me, but it ain't up to me. Okay. Well, we, at least we know what to do now. So, in you've had. I mean, you, you, you can get the show by some skullduggery. If you are willing to do skullduggery, you can get the show. Okay. But I ain't going to do that because that's no. money out of my pocket when you do that. No, I think I, I, there is skull to be had where you can get the Well, I think it's on Amazon Prime, but only in America, which is obviously no use to us at all. Um, so you've had unless you get something where you can hide your VPN. Maybe. Um, yeah, so you've had amazing opportunities since you moved to the US several years ago. Do you think anything has changed in the UK for, for black comedians, or are we still in the same place? They've led. They, they pay lip service to diversity. You know, 
but it's always the, just the one or two that get the opportunities. You can have 700 posh white men on TV. You can have Jimmy Carr, Michael McIntyre, Jack Whitehall, all posh white dudes on TV. But yet you can only have one or two black people at a time on TV, or they put them all in one show. Like, I love Family Land. That's a great show, and I'm really yeah. happy that that show's got on. I think the sketches are hilarious. I think they're super talented. But I want to see all of them branch off and get their own thing, just like they do with white shows. All of them need to branch off, and all of them need to have their own projects. You know, all of them. That's my alarm, sorry. That's right. Yeah, so all of them, you know, uh, it shouldn't only be Judy Love on Loose Women and all that. They, other black women need to have their talk show. You know, they they pick one. Yeah. And that's the one that has to represent all the black people. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't think it's changed yet. There's a few more of us on TV, which is always good. I'm very happy for the opportunities that the few extra ones of us are getting. But we need more. We need more. And so... Yeah, I don't think anything's changed. They're paying lip service to diversity because of the current zeitgeist. But they'll fall back into their own habits unless they're held to account on a regular basis. You've got to keep their feet over the fire. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, personally, I don't think it's changed much, but it was obviously a big hoo-ha when um, Loose Women had four black women presenting the show. Um, but they're doing it more frequently now, so that's yeah. It's good to see. But I did want well, to say, good, but, I did want to say know, that, that's wonderful. But that is a tokenistic gesture. <laughs> we don't want tokenistic gestures. We, we, we want to just have black women regularly on loose women. We just have black women regularly on loose women. There's what? How many women on that panel? Five. Um, Why can't two of them be four, black? Four. Why can't we have two black, one Indian, one Chinese? Why can't we act like, what's the, with the token? Oh yeah, it's all black women panel. Look what we're doing. Look how progressive we are. No, it's tokenistic. It's fucking performative. That, that, that does nothing for me. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but I did want to say congratulations on being a published author. Um, why was it important for you to write your memoir, Cap Handed, which is out on Thursday, the 8th of July in the UK? It wasn't important. I. I had no idea I was going to write a memoir. I tell you how it came about. Instagram, Throwback Thursdays. Yeah. There's a hashtag called Throwback Thursday and there's another one called Flashback Friday where people post old pictures of themselves. Yeah. So I used to post an old picture and I tell the story behind the picture because I'm like, well, they're not going to know what this means. And I would write the story behind the picture. And I do that every week. That was another other thing I was doing and people loved it people were like oh my god we didn't know you're an engineer we didn't know you went through this we didn't know this like you need to write a book you need to write a book you need to write so every other comment was you need to write a book I'd read your book we and I was like oh okay maybe I will so I started saving those posts in a folder for one day in the future maybe writing a book but I never took it seriously I was just like well if it happens it happens I'll save these stories so I'll remember them when it the time comes to write this book but this is how the universe works around the same time my friend who's a comedian michelle buteau uh she's blowing up right now she's on everything anyway she she's a good friend of mine she calls me up and goes bitch i'm writing a book and my literary agent fucking loves you i'm gonna put you two together you guys have to have a meeting because he loves you and he wants to do something with you so I was like, all right. So I met with her lit agent and lovely guy, Robert Ginsler. He loves black women. He loves, he loves to find talented authors of color. Okay. And queer authors to and promote them. So he's like, I follow your Instagram and your Facebook. I love what you do online. I love how unapologetically you, you are. There's a book in there. You need to write a book. So write me a proposal for a book. And we'll see what happens. And at the same time as that, Tracy Sherrod, a black woman publisher at Harper Collins, had emailed my manager going, I'm a big fan of Gina. Would she ever be interested in writing a book? So this was all happening at the same time. The universe just was like, you're writing a book. You don't know it, but this is what's happening. You're writing a book. And this yeah. is the universe just going, you're writing a book. And it all happened. Like, so I wrote this proposal. And my agent took it to uh, various publishers. And Tracy Sherrod jumped 
that one. It was like, fuck the other publishers. I asked first, I want this book. And so, <laughs> boom. Brilliant. I got a book deal. They paid in advance and I had to write this book. So that's another reason I had to knock it out during the pandemic because I was like, I don't want to give back this advance. I've spent this shit. So I want to write <laughs> Didn't you move house? Oh, I've moved house twice in the last two years. Okay. So I was living in New York when I got the TV show. I was yeah. living in New York. And so we made the pilot of the show in April. So I said to Chuck Laurie, I said, so if this show gets picked up, when do we start work on it? And he was like, June. So I'm like, I live in New York. My whole life is in New York. So you're telling me I've got two months to move to LA and start work on this show if, if it gets picked up. And he goes, yeah, if it gets picked up, we're starting the writer's room. You've got to be in LA June 6th. So that was in April. So I was like, you know what? I ain't got time to move from New York to LA. I ain't got time because I don't know if this is going to happen or not. It might not get picked up. So what I'm going to do, I got some, I'm just going to buy another house in LA. Okay. Buy a house in LA and just furnish it. And then if, if the show gets picked up, I move straight into that house because Nina was still in New York. She's a professor at a college in New York. So we would have had to be by coastal. So I was like, we can't move our house, sell our house to New York and move to LA because the show might not get picked up and then we're going to be homeless. So I was like, keep the house in New York. I'll buy another house in LA. I'll furnish it. If the show gets picked up, I move straight into the LA house and then we do buy coastal. We go back and forth. And if it doesn't get picked up, I've got a really expensive rental property. So I bought the house, the show got picked up. I furnished the house online. I didn't even know what the house looked like. Like I'd seen it once, made a couple of measurements, then went back to New York and all the furniture, everything we bought online. So I'm, I came out when the show got picked out, I came out on June 2nd, all the furniture came between for the next four days, furniture, furniture coming, TV coming, a cable coming, you know, all of that. And then I started work on June 6th. So I had four days to fill this house with furniture and make it a home. But I did it. So that was that house. We loved that house. But I bought it in North Hollywood, which is great area. It's on the come up and it's very near the studios. But when COVID hit, yeah, you know, it was like for the zombie apocalypse, homeless people, drug addicts just roaming the streets. And I was like, well, you know, Nina, my missus was out here with me by now. She came out to quarantine with me, obviously. And yeah. she's like, this is not conducive to us writing a book. We need to be somewhere quiet and chill. And, you know, this is not. So I was like, you're right. So I bought another house <laughs> out in Altadena. Well, you know, I'm not good with money. So when I get good amounts of money, I have to do something worthwhile with it. Otherwise, I'll spend it on jewelry, sneakers, and gadgets. That's my shit. <laughs> sneakers? Did you just say sneakers? Do you mean trainers? <laughs> trainers. All right. <laughs> Jewelry, I've been in America 14 years. So okay, yeah, so fine. You've got to, All right, I'll let you off. You've got to allow it. You've got to allow it. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that's my thing. If I, if I if I have a good chunk of money, I will spend it. So whenever I get a nice chunk of money, I buy property because that's investment. So I've still got my house in London. I've got, I've got a house in Thailand. I've got this house. I did have a house in Antigua, but I sold that. So I'm into investing because I'm not good with money. So I have to invest it. Otherwise, if it's in my bank, I will spend that shit on bullshit so yeah so we bought another house because we um, through season one i knew i had season two coming so we bought another house and we rented out that house so that's why i've moved so many times that that all makes sense and the new house we're staying we're staying because we love it here um your what was the writing process for cat handed is it similar to how you when you're doing your comedy line your yeah is it, is it a similar process or did you have to get a different headspace? It was a different headspace because I'm writing a book, it's not jokes. Yeah. So, I, you know, I basically said I'm not, because when you're writing stand up as a comedian, yeah. you go, I need to get a laugh every whatever, 30 seconds, or every 20 seconds, whatever. So you got a time, you, you write the joke and then you go, I need a laugh here, I need a laugh here. And you, right, so you time it. But with the book, I wanted it to be humorous. Because obviously people buying the book, they know he's a comedian. So yeah. there's going to be humour in there. But I'm also telling stories that are quite dark and quite traumatic. Mm -hmm. But 
So I, t but I concentrated on just telling the stories and the humor comes out as I'm telling the stories. And then I go back and I, I you know, I add a little a sprinkle a bit of Gina humor through it. So even though these are very dark stories, some yeah. of them, there's no humor in them, but you find the humor. But some parts, I just let that story sit. I'm like, this is a serious moment. I'm not going to try and lighten it by making it. I need it. I need this story to hit. So yeah, the book has humor all through it. People, you can laugh at certain stories. Like right. when I went to Paris and persuaded a bunch of my friends to turn up at the station and pretend that I was going on a school trip. So my mum would know that I was going to Paris by myself. So I got my friends to turn up at the station with suitcases. That's a funny story. <laughs> yeah, that's a funny story and so there's lots of good funny stories in that but there's stories that are, aren't meant to be funny but still turn out pretty funny there's a story about uh, my suicide attempt at 16. okay it doesn't sound like a funny story oh. but in a way it's funny because i took a bunch of pills and i assumed that the pills were going to make me unconscious and i wasn't and i was conscious the whole time but i was pretending to be unconscious because i was like these pills when are these fucking pills going to kick in i'm going to have to just fake it till i make it so these poor ambulance guys had to carry me down four flights of stairs, knowing fully well that I'd only taken a bunch of anodin. So there's no way I was unconscious, but I was playing unconscious, waiting for the pills to kick in. So even though it's a serious subject, yeah, and I, I definitely talk about what led to the suicide attempt and yeah. what happened afterwards, I still managed to get humor in. The so yeah, it's a different process. It was a different process because I didn't want to just make it a jokey book. It's not a joke book. I'm covering yeah. some serious issues in there, but you still you still want a piece of my signature humor, which runs through the book. Yeah, I think it's. I was going to ask that because obviously a lot of people that buy the book will be to laugh. So it's good to know that 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 you've got that balance there, and you also made the decision. Yeah. You made the decision to narrate the audio. Why, why was that? Oh, important? absolutely. Why, why was that? Important? Who else is going to tell my story? Who else is going to tell my story? My, I make my living as a storyteller. This is true. I go on stage, I tell stories. They're funny stories, but I'm a storyteller. So there's no way that I, that my story, that somebody else is going to tell my story. So there was absolutely, there was never a question that I was going to narrate that book. Thank you. And uh, finally, you uh, made the decision to include a quote from Cicely Tyson. Why was that particular quote of importance yes. to you? Why did you choose that quote? Because I went through life, people putting me down a lot. People putting me down, people trying to bring me down a peg or two, people thinking I'm too confident or too cocky or too mouthy or too this, too that. And it took me a while to discuss to realize, hold on a minute, a lot of these people who are putting me down are insecure in their own abilities. They're fearful. And because they are fearful, they are threatened by someone else who appears to be completely together. And so they feel they have to pull you down. Yeah. So that's why I use that quote, because I was like, it, it was an epiphany I had. I had this epiphany uh, when I first started, started doing comedy, I had this epiphany back in 97, I'm going to say, I had this epiphany. Where when I first started doing comedy and I was doing quite well, quite quickly, and a lot of comedians were awful to me, yeah. talking shit about me behind my back, which is horrible to me. And I was like, I don't understand why people are treating me like this. Yeah. I'm not a horrible person. I don't understand. And it was based on their own fear, their own fear their own fear and their own discomfort and their yeah. own lack of confidence in their own abilities. And they projected that shit onto me. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, I was like, oh, these, these fuckers are scared of me. This is why they're so awful. They're scared of me. And when I made, when I had that realization, oh, that was it. I was like, hmm. oh, well then I'm gonna give them something to be scared of. Cause <laughs> I, I don't, cause when you come on the, when you first come into a, group and a new job you want to make friends you're trying to yeah. make friends you're trying to make people like you you want people to like you but when i realize they're never gonna like me unless i dumb myself down um, so fuck them i'm gonna be the best i don't i'm not here to make friends i'm here to be successful so i'm gonna be the best that i can be and let them keep hating me and so that's and, what I did. and, and that's here we are been, that's been my attitude since then and, and here, here we are. are um and is there another book in you have you got the writing bug now? Absolutely. Okay. Are you 
able to give me some if information you read about. the first book i was originally uh, i would say i've got the writing bug but i've definitely got more stories to tell because you know i was trying to have the book come up to present day but my childhood was so rich the the first half of my life was so rich. i was like squeeze my life America into two chapters because there's so much more that I, that I went through when I moved to America. So yeah. I ended cack handed on me getting on a plane to come to America. Oh, so wow. The second book will be my journey after I got off that plane. Oh. So there's a second book if this book does well enough. So you lot need to buy the book if you want to hear the stories of how I got to where I am now, where yeah. the struggles that I went through in America to get to the point where I am now, to get the success that I have now. You need yeah. to buy Cack Handed, make that successful, so then my publisher will go, oh, that did well, let's do another one. So there you go, it's on you people. It's on buy us. The fucking book. Uh, what, I haven't got a copy yet, but um, have you got a copy to hold up? Oh, absolutely. Please, so we can see the cover. Indeed, I have a copy. Here is the book. Thank you. And one, my final question for you. And that is, is my handwriting. That is my handwriting. I love it. I like the lime green colour. I don't think I've seen a lime green book cover before. Cack handed. Because I'm a nice colourful cover. I wanted a nice colourful colour that will catch people's eye. Yeah, it's definitely so stands out. Ooh, what is this? So yeah, it's, it does stand out. And why should aphrodisiac readers buy your book? My last question. Because it's good. It's good. You'll recognize yourselves in, you will recognize yourselves in these stories. Okay. You will recognize various aspects of your life in these stories, whether you're on my side of the story or the other side of the story, you will yeah. recognize yourselves. Uh, the stories of, you know, uh, uh, they are, <laughs> you know, it's a, a time immemorial. These stories are always going to be pertinent, like stories of sexism, racism, misogyny, the struggle, the, the story of my immigrant parents and why she left Nigeria and came to England, the history behind that, the history of, of why uh, African people and Caribbean people were at odds for a long time, where, where white supremacy played a role in that. You're going to learn a lot. I mean, you're going to learn a lot. I mean, it's not a history book. I use the history to weave through my story so you can know why my parents did certain things, why they left Nigeria, why I was born in England, why, you know, and so you recognize these stories and it's just a good read. Even if you're not, it's just a good read. Okay. It's a good book. Thanks. I, I know I'm saying that myself. I didn't know if it was a good book or not, but when I started narrating it, I was like, oh, no, this is a good book. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading it. Can I just get a picture before we log off? Could I get a picture of you holding the book, please? Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank um, you. I will speak to you soon. Hope to see you in the UK soon, please. Oh, I'll be back. Don't worry. I've been itching to get back. Yay. Tell Biden and fucking Bojo to get their shit together. I shall. Thank you, my love. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>